Good morning. Where's my response? Very welcome to the aspirational mega session. <laughs> Look, I will tell you something before we start. You are my favorite MIPCOMers. Why? Because you have picked the best session at MIPCOM 2015, right? You like documentaries, so we speak the same language. So thank you very much for being here. My name is Ali May, and uh, in the next hour, I will be hosting three mega guests from National Geographic, BBC, and Atlantic Productions. The company that, beyond um, other things, among other things, does the David Attenborough films. Now, because you're my favorite people, I would like to throw in a little extra for you. So we're going to have a competition. Uh, what I'd like you to do is, my Twitter's up there, Ali May TV. I'd like you to tweet a couple of things. And there are prizes from BBC, National Geographic, and Atlantic. Uh, first of all, let me just drop this in. This is not helping. First of all, what have you seen on National Geographic Channel and BBC that has really surprised you one way or the other? That's question one. Question two, if there was no limitation, where would you like to see David Attenborough presenting? So you're going to win some amazing box sets and all that. But there's a bonus. The person who does the best hashtag is going to get a signed copy of my book, Geography of Attraction, which is incidentally very appropriate for the morning. It's about six. How about that? So I get tweeting. After the session, my guests and I are going to judge outside, and we are going to announce the winners on a live Facebook uh, video on Ali May TV, which is my page. Uh, so tune in, um, and we will tell you who wins at 11 o'clock. So, Without further ado, I would, like to, I would like you to join me in welcoming to stage my first guest, Liz Dolan. Brilliant. Thank you. So high, high energy for this hour. I love it. I'm high on documentaries. What can I say? <laughs> Please. Good morning, Ali. Good morning, Liz. Thank you very much for joining me. Well, I'm so excited to be here because, you know, blue chip legacy it seems like a heavy weight for any brand to bear. But at the National Geographic, we're just so excited about our future. You know, we really have a whole new vision of being really the world's premium science, adventure, and uh, exploration network. And I'm going to show you some things today that are going to prove how we're going to do it. Amazing. And um, actually, that's a very good start, a point to start. Is it safe to say that um, at National Geographic Channel, you are somehow actually repositioning it to become even more specialist. Yeah, we really, when I say a premium network, we really mean we want the content to be bigger, better, more epic. We really learned a lesson when we had uh, Cosmos on the air two years ago, mm -hmm. and that was a global day and date launch. It was just an amazing production, and it became one of the best shows ever on the channel. So we started to think to ourselves, what if every show could be at the level of Cosmos? Could we really do that? Could we move everything to this more epic scale and be more ambitious? So what you'll see in what I'm showing today and also on the future National Geographic channel is more A-list talent, both in front of the camera and behind, more epic attempts at storytelling on our planet and others. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I think it's going to be a whole new Nacho. We're very excited. Uh, but uh, why are you doing that now? What is part it? Is it the competition landscape? Is it something inside the, the company? I think it does come from inside the company, because remember, National Geographic is at its heart a scientific, mission-oriented organization. And you know, they say they really believe in the power of science and storytelling to change the world. So who doesn't want to sign up for that, right? Science and storytelling can change the world. Uh, we want to be part of that. It's an important time for big science to actually be heard, for facts to get out about things, for people to understand their world and their lives. So it's just the biggest ambition we could think of, and that's what we're going to do. It says mega session, right? Mega aspirational. We are super mega aspirational. Well, talking of mega science, <laughs> right? Talking of mega science, let's have a look at your breakthrough. Right. Right, so the first clip we're going to show is called Breakthrough. Why don't we just roll it? It's yep. a, uh, you'll see that, again, you know, some of the A-list talent I talked about, we can talk about it after. This is sure. Breakthrough. Please roll the tape. 
Fantastic. So that comes next month. Oh, fantastic. So you're using six uh, megastars mm -hmm. of Hollywood making these six films. Okay, what's the pitch? Right, Tell so, us about it. So, you know, it's Ron Howard on longevity and Angela Bassett looking into the water crisis and, you know, one is on vaccines. And it was really for each director slash talent uh, to find a subject about science in the future that fascinated them and they wanted to dig into anymore. So Paul Giamatti, it's just a whole session on tech and what technology will be able to do for us. And it's amazing. And we, you know, it's a joint production between National Geographic and GE, you may have noticed. So that's a very unusual model for us. We have not done that before. But we were just both such big believers, both National Geographic and GE, in getting important messages about science, you know, like in a big, engaging way out to the public. It's really been a great partnership. Now, as you know, uh, funding is going to be the holy grail for this crowd. Mm -hmm. So everybody's looking for new untapped forms and models of funding for amazing productions. But when you say this is a new model, is it? Or is it just uh, yet another sponsorship deal by a corporation? It is not a sponsorship deal. They really came to us as part of the production. Mm -hmm. They had also been thinking about it on their own. So it's very different from promotional deals that we have made with sponsors in the past. You know, they also just have a goal to get science information out into the world in an engaging way. You know, and most of all, we just want the idea of breakthrough is also about the idea of solutions. There's so much about science that can be bad news or scary news or, you know, it's Ebola or, you know, climate change. And so we wanted people to hear and see this show because it's about things that, that amazing scientists are doing right now. So that's why they're paired up with the stars. Yeah, and although it is uh, all about big science, but still it's quite accessible because it's about the issues that um, uh, concern yes. all of us. That's why we're giving it a global global day and date launch, you know, that's something that we have really pioneered wow. at the National Geographic Channel and at Fox. So you'll see this show next month get the same kind of launch, 171 countries around the world that we gave to Cosmos several years ago. So we do, we have the scale to really get this information out to a lot of people. Okay, let me ask you a cheeky question. If you were to compare these two, Cosmos and uh, Breakthrough, which one is your favorite? Oh, that is so unfair, oh, Ali. No. Oh. Who said it should be fair? <laughs> Well, let's just say um, this is my favorite show about our planet, and Cosmos is my favorite about other planets. Can I get away with that? I think she might there, be running there... for office soon. <laughs> no, I'm going to show you one about Mars coming up that could be my new favorite show about other planets. Okay, if you agree, let's move on to the story of God with Morgan Freeman. The story of God. is. Don't we all really believe that Morgan Freeman is God anyway? No, right? I don't know. So... I want you to come clean. Is he God? <laughs> Maybe this is what he is going to reveal in the series. This is why you're going to have to watch. Okay. So Story of God will be Morgan Freeman going around the world, exploring what he believes is the biggest issue man can face, which is what is the divine? Is there such a thing as God? And if there is, obviously many people around the world believe there is, and yet the religious rituals and beliefs are totally different all over the world. So this is his personal journey to some of the most iconic religious sites in the world. So we have, okay. a, let's look at the clip let's run and then the, we can talk yeah, about it. Let's run the, run the tape. Tape, why do I call it tape? <laughs> So I'd call the quest for God mega aspirational, wouldn't you? I, I would, uh, and it would be quite uh, interesting for an atheist to say that, but hey, why not? Um, <laughs> no, I think that's what, one of the points of the show, is whether you're a believer or a non-believer, this is his personal journey through many of the world's religions and practices, and things will be revealed. I think that's, that's why National yeah. Geographic wanted to do it. It's science and anthropology. And I think the, 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 kind of, the thing that sets this apart from something like Breakthrough is its tone in a way. It's very gentle, it's very soft, it's very right, personal, right. Uh, whereas Breakthrough is a massive, big science uh, Sure, project. and when you say things are epic, it doesn't mean that everything has to be this giant scale. Yeah. It doesn't need to be loud. It, this will be a personal journey. It will take him to some very loud places, I can tell you that. Um, you're you're sure. shooting now, right? This is shooting right now. Yeah. And uh, this will debut in the spring. This will also be a global day and date launch. Okay. Again, something that I think we really excel at because the National Geographic Channel has the scale to do things in such a big way. So um, I think this is really going to be an exciting show. Great. Um, so from one great person to another. So you have another very personal show. He, uh, he named me Malala. And I think Malala is a big name now. Uh, mm -hmm. She's a Nobel Peace Prize winner. There's a lot of media coverage around it. And that only means one thing. Damn hard to tell the story, because how, how are you going to do that? Right. Uh, 
let's run the tape first, and then I'm going to ask you how you manage that question. Sure. Okay, great. This is Inemi Malala. So, you know, the production the manager backstage called this the Goosebump session. And for me, in the whole session, this is the Goosebump clip. We are so incredibly proud to partner with, you know, our sister company, Fox Searchlight, um, is doing the theatrical distribution. And then we'll have the show now, on Before we get to that, because it's, it's an important question I have mm -hmm. for you. But before that, tell me about the storytelling. How okay, did you so address the story, that? So, you know, Davis Guggenheim uh, himself has an Oscar. But I was thinking, you know, She's got a Nobel Peace Prize. I think that trumps an Oscar. <laughs> anyway, so he knew there was something interesting and in this story. And there's also an age gap, so we should yes. consider that too. <laughs> the, he was trying to figure out what was his yeah. way in, because her story has been very well told yeah. uh, all over the world. And he was spending time with she and her father. <clears throat> and that's when he realizes that little bit that you saw in there, that her father named her after someone who had herself been a freedom fighter, someone who had spoken up for rights. So that she was given this aspirational yeah. name and then lived up to it in a way no one in that part of the world could ever have imagined a schoolgirl would be able to do that. Uh, Davis Guggenheim says he knew then in the moment that was his way into the story. And it makes the story different than the version of Malala you've seen before because um, the father is quite a prominent figure in the film no. and even gets into a little bit of the discussion of did he push her too hard? Did he push her too out front? Mm. Does he bear some responsibility okay. for the burdens that she has taken on? And uh, back to that amazing business side of things, that right. you have so, this great uh, partnership. Yes, because National Geographic Channel and Fox Searchlight are all part of the same company, 21st Century Fox, uh, we are helping them, Fox Searchlight, promote the, the film right now, which, as a matter of fact, I'll be in London tomorrow night for the European premiere. And then as soon as the theatrical run is through, we will have it as a worldwide television event on the National Geographic Channel. And that's because Malala's number one goal in agreeing to do the film was that we had to get it to the widest possible audience mm -hmm. of girls and their parents around the world. And again, that's where the scope of the National Geographic platform on television can get that out to a lot more people than a single documentary yeah. in a theatrical run could. Brilliant. Um, I'm aware of time, so I think oh. we're going to go straight from Pakistan to Mars. Mars. Let's can you please run, let the, it rip. run the tape? Okay. <laughs> Red Planets. <laughs> I suppose the genre-busting element of this is really exciting. Factual fiction come yeah, together. So what Tell this us about show that. will be, um, it is genre-busting, truly, because you will have a scripted series taking place in the future, people living on Mars, which has always captivated the human imagination, supported in the series with interviews with the scientists who are working on all of that technology now. So if we want to be on Mars in 30 years, someone has to be working on it now. So you'll get that combination of nonfiction interviews and scripted imagination of what life will be on Mars. And we have all kinds of great scientists, technologists, and dreamers, visionaries like Elon Musk working with us on this show. A very serious question. Would you live on Mars? No. I think I don't think it's the getting there that would be hard for me. Once I got there, I'd be OK. But being in the little capsule for too long, I think it's four years or something. I, I, it's not my thing. Thank you. Uh, OK, guys, you need to know a couple of things. So Liz runs the, she is the chief marketing officer for um, Fox International Channels, which includes National Geographic. But apart from that, she has a very interesting, yet again, creative side to her. Uh, she runs a very popular podcast in the U.S. called Satellite Sisters, which, believe it or not, was downloaded over 2 million times in the past 12 months. Why is it called Satellite Sisters? Because Liz runs it with her four sisters who live across the U.S., um, and their book is coming out on the 27th of this month. Thank and you, Ali. And it's called You're the Best. <laughs> so uh, at that, uh, on that bombshell, I'm going to say thank you okay. so much, Liz Dolan. And you're the best. OK, you're the best, Ali. Thank you. Liz Dolan. Thank you very much. For those of you who came later, we are running a Twitter competition. You need to tell us what you have seen on BBC and National Geographic Channel to win some amazing box sets and whatnot. Also, the best hashtag is going to get a copy of my signed book. So. I'm going to ask you to help me welcome to stage Anthony Geffen. Anthony Geffen is the CEO and founder 
am I right? Yes. Of Atlantic Productions. And if you don't mind, for those who may not be as familiar with Atlantic, I'd like to start with running your showreel. Wow. Anthony, for 20 years, you and Atlantic have been at the very forefront of uh, production technology. 3D, 4K, IMAX, now virtual reality, you name it. What propels you? Well, I think, you know, I'm of a generation now that in television that wants to and realizes we're big specials and other things that you've got to push the bounds. You've got to, it's all about storytelling, that's what everything's about, but you've got to use the latest technology and the cleverest ways of engaging big global audiences in, in important matters and issues and stories, you know. And that's what we're driven by and we're lucky to have uh, you know, been on the forefront of some of those technologies. And um, it, it might sound silly, but uh, which of those technologies have kind of excited you when they, they were very new, when they were just born? Well, you know, I, I think a lot of people think, you know, and it isn't a broadcast sense for a while, held back 3D, but 3D was incredibly exciting, and it has been for the last five years in the joint venture we've done with the Sky Television, because we've really been able to almost change the way people see stories. And, and, you know, when you get to see 3D, and you get to see these yeah. 3D films, you're certainly doing IMAX films in, around the world when we make them to IMAXs. But if you do get them to see them on television, which is hard at the moment, uh, they, they are pretty, pretty dynamic. But having said that, you know, we'll talk later about virtual reality. That's very exciting too. I think, you know, I think we find different, different stories lend themselves to go on different, different platforms. Just to put this character into perspective, uh, Anthony was once called to go up and climb on Mount Everest because his team was making a film and some people were ill. So he had to climb that little hill and help the team. So that was very exciting. Let's, uh, let's start with your coup. Uh, you got Barack Obama, the president of the United States, to interview David Attenborough. How did that come about? Well, that, that will be in my next book. No, it's not true at all. But, uh, um, it came about through um, willingness on both sides to want to make it happen. But what I loved about it was, I didn't really realize this was, you know, I knew it was, I knew it was true, but I didn't know until I sat in the Oval Office and uh, the president turned to me and he said, I would like to interview David Attenborough. And I said, I sort of thought for a moment, the presidents don't normally interview anybody, you know. And what I realized at that time was that he was passionate about Attenborough and what he represented and what he is and had grown up with David as a kid in Hawaii. And for him, he wanted to put away, in a way, his presidential hat, if you like, his metaphorical yep. hat. And he wanted to, to, to interview the man, one of the people he most admired in yep. the world, which is pretty extraordinary. Yep. Uh, and that's what was exciting. And then it's the only time I've ever seen David, and I've known him a long time and worked with him a long time, slightly nervous since the following day when, I, when we were sitting outside the Oval Office. David never shows that he's nervous, but he was slightly nervous. And I'm sure he was building himself up for, a, for this important interview. Yeah, yeah. But it was pretty extraordinary sitting there, and I had to pinch myself, thinking, you know, we have Secret Service, the President, David, myself, you know, sitting in a room. And it was, there was a chemistry. And they talked about really yeah. important issues. Let's have a look. So now we're, um, they're talking about the Great Barrier Reef, and that is, hmm. ladies and gentlemen, exclusive video that is going to be seen here for the first time. Yeah. Uh, so tell us about that show. Can I just finish off that one, actually, because it's exciting Absolutely. what happened to it, Ali. Um, what, what's interesting about, and this is, I think, the changing way broadcasting works interesting. The Obama interview went out uh, with huge support from, obviously, the BBC. BBC Worldwide sold to 100 countries. But it was then followed by a push in social media with people like Google. Uh, and I'm told it reached an audience who saw part of or all of that documentary of something like 100 million people in a week, which is staggering. Uh, and what's really exciting is someone at Google told me that the search engine, all the, the key words used in the interview, Great Barrier Reef, climate change, went shooting up the search engine. So what I think is exciting is that an event like that, and what it became, can have a huge impact. So much so that it has, in a sort of small way, influenced some of the things that the US government, which we're always going to do it in climate change, but getting confidence to realize the world was ready to talk about climate change. So, it's interesting how television can act as a platform for that. Brilliant. So uh, with that, let's then have a look at uh, Great Barrier Reef, and then I'll ask you yeah. about the series. Yeah. Great indeed. And not only this is an epic landmark uh, production for television, but also you're taking this uh, to be 
an entirely multi-platform experience. Yeah, with a, with a lot of our productions, we've built out on different platforms. But um, with this one, there is obviously the four-part series, um, which is uh, obviously for the, well, the three-part series for the BBC International is actually a four-part because of the making of, uh, distributed by E1, who's doing a fantastic job for us. Um, and we'll be in the BBC Christmas time-ish. Um, uh, but the other elements are we've got a digital um, pod um, which allows you to literally interact with things that are going on on the reef. Uh, you can skim, uh, skin the, uh, the, the, the ocean and see the reef. You can, uh, you can interact with the weather patterns. It's a kind of truly interactive experience. Then beyond that, there is a virtual reality experience where you can put on your, your VR headset and dive uh, and, you know, with, with the crew uh, and the team when we, uh, you know, when we were filming. Very, very interactive experience. And then, of course, the whole thing in the future is coming to a 3D IMAX. So it's a kind of, you know, and there are also some museum exhibitions around the world. So it's a kind of lots of multi-levels, which, you know, which is great. Amazing. Uh, and that is pretty much how you make money out of it, but by creating an experience at the National History Museum, well, we work with partners. I mean, yeah, everybody you know, works together. We're, you know, we're partners with yeah. the BBC and the other partners, so we work yeah. with them in each territory to, to build it out. You know, uh, I mean, it's a big event. You know, this is a big one. I remember asking David, I worked a lot with him, I think that was my 11th production um, or project with him, and um, I said, David, if there's one place left you want to go, where do you want to go? And without a split second between my <laughs> talking about it, he said, the Great Barrow Reef. He said, I was there 60 years ago, and I want to go back, and I want to be able to film it, hear about the new science, see the new behavior. He didn't at that time say he wanted to dive to the bottom of the ocean, because I didn't have the Aleutia research ship in place. But you know, David's been able to do something. He he's never, was, never was able to see the deep sea then. And no one's been able to see it now, because this, these Triton submarines, which are amazing, took David, this great you know, energetic 89-year-old, to the bottom of the ocean. But, David gets transformed on location. David, you know, is about 35 when you're filming with him. Um, uh, you know, I shared a cabin with him, I can tell you. He's just, you know, all night and all day, we're, we're talking about what we're going to do, and we're going to put another dive in, you know, early in the morning and another dive late at night. It's incredible. But this was a passion of his. He's passionate about all projects, but this project I really believe he was passionate about. It's a kind of, I like to see it, I don't think necessarily he does, but it's a kind of message about, you know, not only the reef, but the planet, climate change, but without ramming it down your gob. You know, there's a lot of films that are brilliant, but I think the audience is a little bit, you know, please don't give me climate change and everything straight on. And, and I hope we've, we've found a cleverer way of doing this. David, David shows you how fantastic the place is and what you need to say rather than, you know, but the last hour does, does, does deal with it. Right. You know, there are rumors that Morgan Freeman might be God, but after this experience, I, I have a feeling maybe David Attenborough is, or maybe they, they run yeah. the show together. I think, having worked with them both, they're both <laughs> gods, but David is a very special god. Yeah. Let me move on from national history to history. Mm. Uh, I really like your uh, new series, uh, Inside the Commons, mm. and partly because I know how damn difficult it is to get access to film there for half an hour inside the Mother of Parliament. Mm and you managed to film for a whole year. Let's have a look at the clip and then tell us about it. Brilliant. Is it common practice to take cocaine at the parliament? <laughs> <laughs> Snuff. Snuff, all right, they all say that. Yeah. You should have put a caption, shouldn't we? <laughs> How did you stuff. get that access? That's incredible. No, it took six years. Um, wow. And uh, you know, our body of films, I think, helped, but a, a number of other people, the BBC were trying to get in, everybody was trying to get in, and in the end, I think, you know, we won the trust of enough of the committees, you know, that were there to think that we would do a fair and balanced job, and that's what we tried to do. I mean, it's interesting, it's kind of a portrait of power in one level, and yeah. it's also a portrait of this extraordinary historical place that half the MPs don't know half of what exists there. Yeah. Um, and I was there one day um, filming with the team, and uh, there was a rat-a-tat-tat coming down the corridor, and I thought, well, God, what's this? And there's a whole lot of beefy just stamping and looking with torches. And the guy just said, oh, no, it's November the 5th. You know, every year <laughs> since November the 5th, this ceremony takes place. <laughs> and nobody knew about it, nobody. Not even the prime minister when I spoke yeah. to Martin <laughs> knew about this ceremony. You know, there, every sort of room you went into, there was something strange. Yeah, anyway, it's, it's important that these things yeah. are captured. And I don't think they're going to let cameras in for a long time, not because yeah. they don't want them back, but because they feel we've made the portrait. Yeah, yeah. You know. And apart from those uh, very intimate... Uh, portraits of the place. I think the drama there is incredible. You know, yeah. look at the Prime Minister's question times yeah. on Wednesdays. That's incredible. No, 
No, we were lucky. It took, uh, after six months, it was like we hit a lot of stone walls, and then suddenly people thought, gosh, if we are going to make this, let's, let's cooperate, let's yeah. collaborate. And then, you know, but actually, amazingly, the MPs were very happy with it, so I'm, okay. I'm very pleased they were. We, we said exactly what we felt, and we didn't you know, yeah. hold back any punches. Okay. Uh, moving on, yeah. uh, one of the things I admire about you on Atlantic is that normally you're at the frontier, you take a new technology and you turn that into viable business. Mm. And that is where I'd like to talk to you about your virtual reality business, mm. Alchemy VR. Yep. Uh, tell us a little about that and then let's watch the film okay. later. Um, basically, you know, a lot of people here will know cardboard or, or gear VR or, or different things. Now, our approach to this was great, great technology about two years ago. The fact it's going to come from a mobile device, the fact it's going to be very cheap, very accessible, great. But we wanted to tell full-scale stories. I didn't want to just sit there on a street corner and see people in virtual reality. So we set out to build a new company called Alchemy VR to actually, you know, and it's taken a year and a half to two years, but we've now reached the point where we signed deals with uh, Samsung, Google, uh, Actually, Sony. can we have a copy of your uh, goggles? Can somebody bring yeah. me the goggles? Hang on, here we go. Now, you can't keep these, you know. I am so keeping them. <laughs> You're just trying to get your mitts on them. Um, uh, and, and anyway, uh, so and we had to bring in a, a cross -cross. I mean, Atlantic already consists of five companies, including uh, companies that produce com computer graphics. So we could amalgamate all those skills into the sort of shooting skills that are needed for this. And you'll see in this little clip, it's complicated. And then what we call the stitching, which is the back end. All of this will become easier. All of it will become more, more you know, just easier to do for filmmakers. But at the moment, at the high end of this, you know, when we want to do it in 4K, and 4K resolution in front of your face is amazing. Uh, you know, anyway, do we, do we yeah, want to I see mean, some? even this yeah. is incredible. I had the chance to go to Anthony's office on Friday and try these on. And this is just a smartphone. And uh, you, you are basically on the water at Great Barrier Reef. And what happens, uh, one minute you're looking at the fish, and the other minute, David Attenborough floats by in his yellow submarine. It's absolutely incredible. Although I wasn't wearing my glasses, which was a, little bit, a bit of a bummer, but this is the future. So I suppose- well, so a bit so of the future anyway. Yeah. A bit of the future, yeah. true. Uh, mm, so far, I think uh, the, the very obvious uses of uh, VR was in gaming and maybe adult entertainment. Yeah. But yeah. I think what you're doing with this is mm. completely immersing viewers into mm. an experience which mm. is maybe not in their homes, but mm if you take that to an experience, mm. uh, an event, mm. a place, that is incredible. Mm. So do you want to, are we going to see a clip of this? Or, or Absolutely. We, yeah. and, Absolutely. Then, and then let's talk about how we monetize it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, I, you know, I think, I think that, you know, the message that people are interested in VR is, is it's, there's, there's so many different devices at the moment, so many different ways of doing it, and it's actually quite expensive and complicated. But I'd get out there, use a simple you know, rig, and start shooting, because it's going to be a very big thing. It's not going to replace television, it's not going to replace cinema. It's going to be its own thing. It's very powerful. There will be ways and platforms of making money, uh, much quicker than a lot of other things. Um, I don't know if we got a still, have we? Uh, we actually saw the still earlier when we you were did? talking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. dear. The still was there, so. Okay. So the, the whole anyway, idea is that you okay. were, yeah. So, so to prove it, we opened uh, an experience, um, uh, David Attenborough's Natural History, uh, well, no, it was cool, sorry. Uh, first life, the first life experience where you went back in the Cambrian Ocean 350 mil million years ago on a 10 minute experience. It was in the appropriately named Attenborough Cinema at the Natural History Museum. Opened shows many, many times a day and it sold out completely for three months. It's now sold out for another three months. It's something people want to engage with. That's cinema, people are paying, I think, six ninety nine or something to pay. You know, there is a, a model emerging. Uh, so I just throw it out to people to enjoy. And, Great. Uh, so uh, on that bombshell, I think we're going to end this. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I was going to tell you a really interesting story about Anthony, but you'll have to come back next year, hopefully in another keynote. Anthony <laughs> Geffen, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you yeah, so much. Thank you very much. Thank I'm going to take that earlier or I'll never get it back. <laughs> yeah. And my next guest is Natalie Humphreys. Please welcome her to stage. Hi, Natalie. Very welcome. How are you? Thank you for having me on the Ali May Show. Oh, thank you very much for being on <laughs> Ali May Show. It's a pleasure. So, Natalie Humphreys is the controller of 
BBC, Factual Television, and Daytime. Um, but apart from having that incredible uh, position, there are other things about her. She has a PhD in zoology, of all things. But there's one thing that's really tripled my respect for you. Can okay. you guess what? Uh, I'm a bit worried about where this is going to go, but please go. She was <laughs> one of only 20 people invited by Richard Dawkins to his retirement dinner at Oxford University. Respect. <laughs> <laughs> and she, he was also your moral tutor, wasn't he? He was my moral tutor, yes. I mean, I love yeah. that. Talking yeah. about Morgan Freeman and David Attenborough being good yeah. and then having Richard Dawkins as a moral tutor. Incredible. I think without uh, any further ado, we're going to have a look at your showreel Great. and then we're going to have a nice conversation. Lovely. Please. Thank you. Did you notice me dancing to that summertime? It was fantastic. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> I love working in television. Isn't it brilliant? It's uh, fantastic. Yeah. But Natalie, BBC is under pressure, a lot of it. You're stuck with a frozen licence fee. Uh, you have uh, incredible competition popping up right, left and centre. Mm. But still, you manage to produce a thousand hours of breathtaking factual television a year in-house. That's right. How do you manage that? How do you stay ahead? You know, Ali, I think I love that tape because I think in a couple of minutes it sums up everything that we stand for, really. Um, yes, it shows the breadth right across natural history, science, documentaries, history, features, and that's the thousand hours you talk about. But, but above all, what screams out for me is um, we're always looking for things that will surprise. Uh, frankly, surprise ourselves, you know, as filmmakers, hopefully, but, but really surprise people. I think the other thing is... The truth is everything for us. You know, if, if there's one thing that unites everyone that works in our production outfit, it's, it's that. Um, and of course, that's, that's the joy. You know, that, that tape's quite joyful as well. It's the joy of factual storytelling, is that you are dealing with the facts, you're dealing with the truth. There's, there's a, a clip in there of Life and Death Row, the young guy who's yeah. um, facing execution. And again, in fact, we just picked up the BAFTA for Best Factual Series with this series. Uh, it was, it was the truth, it was the impact of, of this really happening to this young man that, for me, blows everything else out of the water. And, and I guess the other thing, and you, you and I have talked about this before, it's, it's emotion. Yeah. You know, I don't care what genre you're talking about, if you don't make an emotional connection with your audience, it's game over, really. So, so but just to answer your question more, more explicitly, how do we do it? It's about the talent and the great people. We, we've mm -hmm. got... Um, centres of production excellence all over the UK, as you yeah. know, whether it's the Natural History Unit in Bristol or the science team in London, etc. Uh, and, and we're just really committed to um, training people, to putting innovation first and to just growing that, that, that great talent because you, you can't have great shows without great people. Uh, talking of innovation, uh, I'm very interested in all this amazing drama that's coming out. Mm from mm. all outlets, from Amazon Prime, Netflix, let's say House of Cards. Mm. I'm quite intrigued to know whether things of that sort, which is not in your genre, mm. do they inspire your factual filmmaking? Do they inspire? I mean, I think we're just inspired by, by TV, you yeah. know, by, by the extraordinary world of content. And it's interesting, obviously we spend a lot of time talking about this. Drama is the biggest market in terms of revenue. That's just a fact. But, but there's other things going on, you know, House of Cards, I think the first season, 22 hours, mm -hmm. cost 100 million US dollars. Um, for the same money, we made probably 80 to 100 hours of TV, which reached three quarters of the popu population of the UK. You know, so it, it, I, and we, ha we have these conversations about value and about impact, yeah. but you have to be really textured and really specific about it. Um, I'm excited by, by Netflix and Amazon and what those guys are doing. You know, it's great to have new platforms, great to have new things on the market, but, you know, what I would say is a big piece of factual, a big landmark yeah. can reach half a billion people around the world now. Um, I mean, for us, that's about putting it on BBC Earth, yeah. which is, you know, one of our new platforms. Um, you know, we saw this, this um, life story, I don't know if you saw one of our recent landmarks in natural history, there was one clip of one little puffer fish oh, yeah. that makes its, you know, does its beautiful mm -hmm. pattern on the mm -hmm. seabed and, you know, 30, 40 million people saw that. So I think Factual has that impact. Sure. Um, so I, I'd worry about us rushing to steal the clothes of drama and, and being too slavish about how we look at drama. But, you know, I think it's just about being inspired by, by great stories. Well, but all that's uh, in the background. Do you agree with the statement that we are living at the golden age of TV? 
I think it's I think it's definitely the golden age of storytelling. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I look at my I've got two sons and I, I look at how they consume uh, stuff now, um, and and it's no doubt about it. They still love big big experiences, either big cinematic experiences or at home, um, big moments, big events, the sort of thing that will bring us together as a family or that they can talk about with their friends. So it's, I think that, that big, those big stories, you know, yeah. huge. But there's something else going on, I think, which is, um, which is about also, and this is where factual can be really powerful, it's about the stuff that, that we live with, you know, the information that can help me live my life. Yeah. Um, the information that I can share. But, but you know, the, the, the impact of storytelling, I think the other panellists have said it today, um, and we know that there aren't any new stories. No. It's how you tell the stories. And, and for us, I think what we always try to do is show people something they haven't seen before. But, uh, talking of something they haven't seen before, Let's run the tape for Forces of Nature. I watch that tape. I do. We do love to set ourselves nearly impossible challenges as a team. I do think so. We were um, Professor Brian Cox will appear uh, in this series. You know when it airs mm -hmm. on BBC One in the UK, uh, and he's been really involved in 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 the making. Big inspiration actually for it. And um, we sort of sat there one day and said, "What would? How, could we even tell, let alone show, the story of all of the incredible hidden forces that control the planet, ourselves?" Okay. You know, what, why is the earth round? You know, why are hot things red? Why mm -hmm. is the sky blue? Why is nature green? You know, why okay. all these big sort of why questions? And we sort of know, and you can kind of jump on the internet and quickly yeah. find out that, you know, there's lots of big forces, whether it's gravity or... But could we do that in a landmark series? And then if, if we did that, where would we point the cameras? Well, you know, how can you see all this right. stuff? Okay, interesting. Um, and what's amazing is that we've gone out into, again, you know, the real world, you know, the, the, that's where, for me, um, uh, the most aspirational things are found. And we've, we've gone to real stories um, of people and nature. So, for instance, that human tower that you see, you know, there's people oh, yeah. all joining up. Um, we use that to uh, explain the story of shape. So how yeah. shape, why shapes are the shape they are. So it's some quite big science yeah. told through some really uh, accessible real-world stories. It's lovely. So basically, elementary class stuff for the adults to help exactly. learn all about it. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, okay, this is big, this is epic. Mm. Is big enough? It's big enough. You know, big helps. Yeah. You know, as we were saying earlier, big gets, can mm -hmm. get a lot of people to your screen. Um, and, and definitely, I think people are still craving, as we said, the, those wow moments. You know, not, we just all love to sit there, I think, and have our mouth drop open, ideally. That's what big factual can do. How are um, your jaws doing? Jaws open. <laughs> Get the jaws going. Uh, so of course, big helps, but 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 this big isn't enough anymore um, because I just think you know, weirdly, as the world is becoming more global yeah. and we are becoming more global, um, we're becoming more personal as well. There's something okay. really personal going on in, in in our lives, and TV's got to speak to that. So one of the things we're really thinking about at the moment is how we tell stories that are ever more personal, ever more intimate. Uh, well, it's not going to be as intimate as inside a womb, is it? Exactly. So, shall we have a look at Nine Months That Made You? Yeah, let's, let's look at the clip and then I'll, I'll talk around um, how this came about and why we think it's different. Sure. Again, we really thought about how we could bring to life uh, that this is a very intimate, very personal science. Now, one way you do that is obviously telling the stories of real people, actual people. So, there's some very personal stories going on in the show, mm -hmm. of course, and you see some of the characters there. But it's more than that. We wanted the, the style and the tone of the series to feel very personal, so we used prime lenses okay. um, with the graphics. A uh, fantastic company that worked with us, because again, uh, it wasn't enough for us to just have some pictures that said, this is what it is like in the womb. Yeah. We had the graphics written to the scientific research. And I think it's fair to say it's the first time you really do visualize some of these moments that happen in, um, in embryological development that uh, even the embryologists aren't quite sure how it looks, but they've worked with us to, to give the best guess. So, okay. you know, you're seeing something for the first time depicted in, I think it's just beautiful. And, and again, yeah. you just feel very immersed in, um, in it alongside or through uh, the stories of some characters for whom their lives have been dramatically impacted by the events in the womb that we're talking about. Yeah. And it's incredible because not only it looks incredible, mm. but also it is pioneering science. But yeah. let's uh, move on to one of your fortes. BBC is known for its epic uh, natural history. Mm -hmm. And a little bird told me, get it? 
Get it? Well done, uh, very good. That we have uh, another massive landmark coming. Yes. Uh, one planet. Shall we have a yes. look? Yes. Um, oh, do you well, want to talk about it Let first? me just, I'll just set the scene a little bit, because this clip, um, uh, well, the clip speaks for itself, and um, I hope you like it. I mean, I've seen it a few times now, but I still, uh, I still get the goosebumps, actually, so I'd love to, love to understand the audience's reaction to it as well. So, so One Planet, uh, it's a working title at the moment. We called it One Planet because okay. um, we, can't, we now can't quite say of all the planets out there, there's only one planet that mm -hmm. supports life, but there's certainly only one planet that supports the abundance and, and the uniqueness of life that we have. So that was our kind of way into okay. um, the story. But what we wanted to do, and of course, we always, and filmmakers always sit here saying, oh, but the thing that's really different about this series, and there's always something that's different. This series really is different mm -hmm. because we um, are immersed now to a level uh, that we, even we, we, you know, the Natural History Unit haven't mm -hmm. been before. What we've tried to do is get off the tripod, get off the long lens, spend much more time um, through movies, through drone cameras and, and other techniques. And you'll see a technique in this, in this clip that's extraordinary, where we are absolutely there in real time mm -hmm. with the animals when extraordinary things are happening. And we can genuinely say um, that we're seeing things that, that humans haven't seen before because of the way the technology is taking us in. So Brilliant. It's like, uh, it reminds me of uh, old age hunters who yeah. try to be the animal, to try and yeah. basically sniff out, see danger, yeah. see how yeah. everything works. And I think, you know, it, it's worth sort of laboring on this a bit. I mean, in the, in the show reel at the top, you see Steve Batchel mm -hmm. exclaiming, you know, with delight because we see the blue whale turn yeah. up live. And I, you know, we all TV types sit around going, oh, it's a television first, and uh, that really was a television, for, you know, to, to film yeah. a blue whale live. Um, and it's great when you can say that with no hype, you know, and, and I think with One Planet, um, I feel really confident that we are saying that we are showing things and witnessing behavior um, in real time uh, in, in, in an immersed way that, um, that hopefully is really going to knock people out. Now, I recommend you look away if you have a weak heart at the end of this cliff because <laughs> there is a bit of a thrill. It's, it's quite something. So that, that, that um, clip will appear in an episode where we look at um, animals in the urban environment. Mm -hmm. uh, that's Mumbai. Obviously, we know that Mumbai is a really densely populated place full of people. Most people don't realize that there's a huge concentration of leopard that live in Mumbai. Most people, even who live there, don't realize, and that's because they tend to move around under cover of darkness. <laughs> Hence why we, we had to use... Now, that isn't infrared. That's yeah. military-grade thermal cameras, and what's brilliant about those, mm. and we've actually been working with the military to develop... Um, a, 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 you know, a new camera that yeah. we can use, a TV camera, is that you don't need any light at all. Oh. So, so that genuinely is the first time we've been able to track the behaviour in real time of, of a leopard hunting in the city be, uh, under total darkness. And out of um, curiosity, how many cameras did you have for this scene? Because it looked incredible. Yeah. You have all the uh, angles covered and... Yeah, and it's because exactly that, because it's not something that you c we would ever... I mean, we would never recreate yeah. anyway, you know, because back to the truth is everything. Um, but uh, that we just we knew we could get one shot at covering that and um, we had to get it right. So we set up the cameras, obviously, and wow. hoped that, you know, we knew that the, the, the ball were there, we knew the prey were there, but we just hoped the leopard would come and... And we were lucky, and you know, lucky enough, as I say, that the technology worked. Brilliant. Although we're out of time, I need to ask you one last question before you go. Uh, you make fantastic factual televisions, day, television day in, day out. What does inspire Natalie Humphreys? <laughs> oh, you know, for me, I have to be. Oh, I have to be quite personal, I guess, in that. Sense. I, I, I just think that. I mean, I remember myself as a, as a younger child, lying, you know, lying on my belly in the in the in the front room, the living room. Uh, watching TV, watching things like The Ascent of Man and Life on Earth, big, big BBC yeah. factual. Uh, and, it, and, it, and the way it made me feel, it gave me a real sense of um, purpose in my life. I just thought I want to be part of that. I want to understand more about my world. This feels like a way I can do it. I think if, if we can do one, you know, if, if one child watches any, anything that, yeah. that we do and has that same feeling I had, that would be brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Natalie Humphreys, Thank it has you. been thrilling. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot.